Okay, now um, some of you have already done this, but if I could get you to go ahead and type in your county and state. I'm looking at Rand's. Uh, bittersweet. We're going to talk about bittersweet. So, Ray, and that's part of the presentation. So let's let's hold that for a second. And this is good. What I'd like to see is the the geographic distribution of participants. I see Maine, Florida, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, South Carolina. Good, good, good. Virginia, Maryland. Good. Keep those coming. This is going. This does two things for us. One, it it um, it helps uh, helps me get a kind of a geographic perspective of where you all are from, and uh, this is particularly for today. This is going to be advantageous to have this broader uh, presence here, and uh, because a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, problems with plants are being dealt with in other areas, and, and I you know, will be the first to admit that I don't have any um, complete knowledge of, of anything, certainly not about managing invasive plants or undesirable plants. So many of you will have experiences that you can relate to other people. So um, this chat pod is the way that you will do that. Uh, and I see that, okay. Okay, let's uh, let's jump over to the presentation. So as we are uh, going through the presentation, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to write those in the chat pod. I will try to keep track of those as they happen, as they come up, and I'll try to answer them. Um, I won't be perfect in it. But the good news is that they're recorded. So I will be able to, when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll scroll backwards through the questions. I'll be able to pick up those that were asked earlier and answer them. If you see a question that comes in and uh, you have an answer or something to contribute to it, then please feel free to offer that commentary. Okay, um, my name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I run the Forest Connect program for Cornell University. It's an applied research and extension program. I am uh, fortunate to have many great colleagues that I work with. Uh, my background is in forest management and forest ecology, and so this is this is a very fun topic for me. Also, a lot of my research deals with vegetation management and disturbance ecology. So, this is. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. We'll be talking about the ecology and management of, of invasive forest shrubs, vines, and herbs. So without any further chit-chat, let's uh, jump right into it. And this will be a full hour, <clears throat> full hour presentation, probably a bit more. Um, there are two objectives. First, I want to improve our collective knowledge of the ecological characteristics of some of these undesirable forest plants and then to uh, talk about and share some management strategies to control these. You can see that right away I've changed the use of my terms. I've, I've dropped invasive and jumped over to undesirable. I'll also use the word interfering. We'll talk about that in just a second when we define some of these terms. But this is a presentation very much about uh, ecological characteristics and management options. And so I want to try to build initially, build some of the ecological base uh, and management um, management strategies so that when we talk about management specifics, we'll have a way to frame our conversation. Uh, without going into any great detail, there are a number of, of wonderful internet resources. I've listed four up here. Uh, the New York Invasive Species um, page, nyis.info. The Forest Service has their Fire Effects Information System. I think that's what the FEIS stands for. Um, and this is a this is a database of plant uh, information. So it talks about where they grow, how they grow, and uh, how to manage them. Uh, the National Park Service, and I'm sure some other, well, so the Forest Service is a federal agency. National Park Service is a federal agency. 
uh, and, and others, uh, Nature Conservancy, many organizations have great fact sheets online. So check those out. Um, IMAP Invasives is a, is a mapping system that's used to keep track of where invasive species in general are showing up. All of these links are posted on my Ning site if you look in the Invasive Plants blog entry for um, November 14th. So check them out there. You can click into them there. Also, if you have other, you know, what's your favorite invasive species management website, be sure to offer that as well. New York has defined invasive species to focus on three different elements of the behavior of the organism. So they say that invasive species needs to be non-native. It needs to cause um, economic or environmental harm to the environment or to humans. And any of those harms must significantly outweigh any benefit. So there's three pieces. So when people say that's an invasive species, um, technically, in New York, it's supposed to have these three characteristics. Uh, to, to put a little bit of a, of a perspective, though, on invasives, uh, the, the invasives, the, the functional definition is the spirit of that is that these are, are plants or, or other organisms. Uh, we're talking about plants tonight. But these are plants that interfere with human or societal objectives. And by legal definition, they are non-native. Um, many people have some real concerns about emphasizing the word non-native and, and maybe with good reason because most of the exotic or non-native species are not invasive. Um, most of our agricultural crops are non-native and they are not invasive and they have um, uh, very good um, uh, benefits to society. Um, and there are also, on the flip side of the coin, there are some native species that act like invasive species. We'll see some of the characteristics of invasive species in just a second. Um, and there are native species that are taxonomically difficult to distinguish from, um, from their uh, related um, exotic species. So when I, when I talk about these kinds of problems, I try to and typically uh, default for a term called interfering vegetation because these are plants that interfere with whatever we're trying to accomplish as owners or managers. Uh, and and get, because of that, there may be a plant in one context, plant species that is an inter, would you would say this is an interfering plant, in another context it's not. And so it gives us a bit more flexibility. Um, but I will use these terms and also the term undesirable and the alternative term um, uh, desirable plants um, interchangeably tonight. And in many cases, that interchangeability makes sense. OK, the problem with these undesirable forest plants, there have changed terms again. Um, it, it, and you know these because you're here, so you have some experience with these. Uh, and you're, you're trying to understand how to deal with them. Uh, and, and you have your own different, you know, everybody in their own woodlot, their own management practices have experiences that, that describe why these problems happen. Um, I, I think it's also worth noting that there are compounding um, factors that compounding variables that can play into this. So there, and the biggest one is, is with deer. One of the one of the overarching commonalities of undesirable interfering plants is that most of them are not browsed by deer. If you look at the abundance of deer that we have in eastern, eastern woodlands and, and even eastern urban areas, if an invasive plant or a non-native plant or an undesirable plant is a preferred deer browse, it's not a problem plant anymore because the deer will manage that. So many of these species have a negative synergy so that the presence of deer um, accentuates the problems and the abundance of the undesirable plants. And there are three pictures here, two non-natives and one native that can cause problems in many areas. And you can rattle off the list of, of uh, ways in which um, undesirable plants cause problems as well. Given the broad range of species that can cause problems, a common question is people want to know which species are going to invade. 
and it's uh, there've been a, there's been a fair amount of research, uh, not recently I think you know maybe in the uh, 1990s, maybe early in this decade, early in the previous decade, we're already in 2011. So in the early 2000s, 1990s, trying to trying to come up with a good prediction because as they're screening plants to come in and wanting to establish some plants as horticultural varieties, they wanted to have a biological predictor, and that doesn't exist. So it's just it's not easy to predict which plants are going to become a problem. But these next uh, bullets two through four all address a common feature of plants that are uh, potentially problematic, and that is they have some mechanism, some way that they are able to be very successful reproductively. Uh, and, and reproduction can happen either through uh, um, sexual reproduction through fruit or asexual or vegetative reproduction through sprouts or rooting, things like that. So they may be reproductive at a young age and or produce large and frequent seed crops um, and or have large quantities of seed that have great mechanisms for dispersal. So, um, or, and what's not mentioned here is, is uh, capacity for vegetative sprouting. So all of these things, there's something about them that's very successful reproductively. They also tend to be um, insensitive to environmental stress. So they, they'll have an optimum, of course. They'll optimize on you know, a moist site or a dry site or a wet site or whatever. They'll have an optimum growing condition, but they have a broad range over which they can succeed. And they're able to find, if you will, uh, a receptive habitat. Two pictures here. This upper picture is Japanese barberry, and the lower picture is swallowwort. Um, both of those are problematic in some area, and we'll talk about them in more detail later on. So once we've just said, okay, well, so we can't really know with certainty which plants are going to be problems, uh, and I should back up a little bit and say, um, in in any one area, in any one county, there's going to be a couple common problem plants. Um, although, at least in New York, as you move down towards New York City, it seems like the potential for the number of problem plants goes up. Uh, you know, in other parts of the state, there'll be a couple that are a problem. Um, as you move downstate, um, you, you may have half a dozen that are, are common problems, and then a few more that are isolated problems. So which habitat will be invaded? Well, it depends. It depends on the characteristics of the species and also the characteristics of the habitat. And, and there has to be an overlap. And you think about the, the conditions that the invasive species needs. Um, and it needs to have a propagule, whether it's a seed or a vegetative sprout. It needs to have a dispersal mechanism. And it needs to have um, adequate growing conditions once that propagule arrives. Uh, and then the habitat needs to provide that, essentially, that growing space that the propagule can establish it. So there are some, there are two pictures here. This, the upper picture is a sugar bush. Uh, it's been thin, so there's some a, uh, an, a little bit of an increase in sunlight. It wasn't a heavy thinning, but there's not really any soil disturbance. There are some, uh, you know, there's some invasive species that have to have disturbed mineral soil. We'll talk about Japanese stilt grass. In, in a few minutes here, and that does, that particularly spreads well with disturbance. Um, there are other species that don't need disturbance in order to become established. Uh, we talked about oriental bittersweet. My senses, and I haven't looked at this a lot, but my senses oriental bittersweet does not require disturbance. They may be favored by disturbance, but it's not a necessary condition. Uh, the bottom picture shows, shows uh, a landscape that's had a bit more disturbance and, and litter, particularly when I say disturbance, I'm talking about litter disturbance in this case. So you've got a receptive habitat, you have a, uh, a species that has an invasive species that has met its requirements for propagule distribution in seed bed, and then you have a ecological relationship that allows for that invasive species to become established. Can they compete? Are native species dominating the site? Um, things like that. So it's again, it's not an e it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, my sense, though, is that there are 
uh, the, the conditions necessary for successful invasion are more common than not. I'm trying to remember, and some of you who are foresters and work in the woods can can uh, chime in on this. My sense is I'm trying to remember the last time I went into a woodlot and didn't find some invasive plant somewhere. You know, if you go into the heart of the Adirondacks, you're not going to find a lot of them, but um, I suspect they're still around, um, particularly as you get closer to uh, human-dominated landscapes. Okay, so that's that's kind of, we just talked about the ecological characteristics, um, not in great depth, but it gives you a sense of, of the variety of situations. Now let's think a little bit about management. Um, the there, there's this, a framework that I like to use when I think about management, and that looks at, at management options from two different perspectives. And ultimately where we're going with this is trying to pick a tool. What's a tool? And then being able to describe that tool and think about how that tool is going to, or treatment, is going to play out on the landscape. So one way to slice this pie is to think about the method. And the method is the mechanism by which we control the plant. And I, I've focused on two, mechanical and chemical. You could add another column, biological. You could conceivably add a, a fourth column, cultural, although I tend to think of cultural as a mechanical um, method. Uh, the other way to slice that pie horizontally is the mode, and that's the specificity of the target. So is that um, when, when you're applying the treatment, is it selective to, do you select an individual plant and apply that treatment to the individual plant? Or as a broadcast treatment, you say, this is an area that we're going to treat, and uh, everything that's here is going to be treated. So you can imagine that if you have an overwhelming abundance, a truly overwhelming 90, 95, 100 percent dominance by an uh, undesirable plant, you will have maybe an occasional stem of something desirable. It's, it's not, it may not be economically feasible, whether it's organic or chemical, mechanical or chemical, it may not be economically feasible to go in and treat you know, 100,000 stems per acre. Uh, and so you need a broadcast treatment to, to do something. Um, effective. And those isolated plants that are maybe desirable plants don't stand a chance, um, and you're better off um, sacrificing them so that you can get a broader control and create um, uh, open uh, growing conditions knowing that you have a plan to establish something desirable. So I've given some examples of mechanical and selective, chemical selective, um, and all combinations here. And I want to point out that, that, that it's, it's worth deliberately saying, how can I mix and match these? Uh, and, and a case in point is the, what I have listed. I didn't realize this until I was talking at the noon seminar today webinar, the cut stump treatment is actually an integrated selective mechanical selective chemical, right? I've, you, you take a saw and you cut the, the stem, so that's a mechanical selective. You've picked a tree, you've used a mechanical device, a saw, you cut the stem, and then you treat the surface of the stump with the chemical. So it's a cut stump treatment, but is a mechanical chemical selective integrating across those two methods. So what you want to do ultimately is be able to select a management option or tool or a combination of tools that are compatible with the owner's objectives. And when I say owner's objectives, it's what they want to accomplish on the property, but also what their um, aversions are. So there, there are some landowners that are opposed to using chemicals, and that's fine. Uh, we, can, we can use chemical treatments. They'll, they'll be, have different effectiveness than chemical treatments, depending upon the species in question, but um, there are, we can use all of these strategies. So it depends upon their objectives, how much energy and effort um, the owner wants to put into managing it, and then thinking about the efficiency, effectiveness, and some of those potential negative impacts. And negative impacts are both the negative impacts of the treatment, as well as negative impacts of picking a treatment that is not successful. Case in point, in, um, well, I, it might be a case in point. In the Ithaca area, there was an aquatic weed that became established at the southern end of Cayuga Lake at the inlet. 
Uh, it was recognized as an isolated population, but it had great potential to wreak havoc in Cayuga Lake. And the concern was that they had essentially this fall to try and knock that back and get ahead of that um, invasion. If they didn't, then it was going to spread into all of Cayuga Lake, which is however many miles long. It's a very long lake in the Finger Lakes. Um, and, and, it would, and it would be essentially out of control at that point. So um, the, there's a negative cost, uh, a negative, I guess, is that a negative cost or a negative value? There's a cost to um, missing the target when you have that opportunity. Okay, you can think about the different ways that these methods um, uh, play out for the plant. Uh, basically, the mechanical treatments. Uh, try to disrupt the connectivity of the roots and the shoots, or if you're hand pulling, you're trying to disconnect the plant from its um, rooting on the ground. So you've, you've depleted the root reserves, you've disassociated the plant from its ability to acquire resources. In some respects, the chemical, many of the chemical treatments do about the same thing. They disrupt cell growth, they disrupt the ability of the plants to photosynthesize, um, photosynthetic pathways. Um, I'm not enough of a, of a biochemist, I'm not a, anything close to a biochemist, um, to be able to describe those. But there are, my understanding is there are five or six basic um, biochemical pathways that are, are managed through chemicals. And then there are biological controls uh, where you have host-specific insects, fungi, fungi, viruses, nematodes, things like that, that limit the success of the invasive species. Okay, uh, we've talked and touched on some of the uh, mechanical versus chemical. The mechanical treatments tend to be organic treatments. Um, and, and I have, I have used both. Um, I've done research on both. I use both on my property. So I'm not, I'm not, it's not my um, intent, nor is it my, uh, should I be trying to convince you to use one over the other. Um, both of these, uh, think of these in my mind, these are tools. There are different circumstances when you use one tool versus another tool. And you may have a preference for one category of tool over another, but um, you need to think about when one is going to be effective or it less effective. And if it's less effective or if it's going to be as effective but it requires there's some greater cost or some greater input or some greater risk, then consider the alternative. Uh, the only thing I want to really specifically talk about here is to avoid using home remedies. Um, and these are particularly herbicides or they, they're, well, they're not technically herbicides because they're not Maybe they're not labeled, but they um, function as herbicides because they're thought to have some chemical properties. And you've heard these, right? It's you, you get the recipe from your neighbor or from your cousin or from your uncle, and it goes something like, you know, take the coffee that's left over from last Tuesday, mix in dust from the four corners of your bedroom, uh, cut the ears off of your neighbor's cat, um, and stir it together under the moon, uh, under the full moon of July, and you have some concoction that you can spray on plants. Um, and they don't work. They fundamentally don't work. Um, if they do work, you don't know why they work, and you don't know what other kinds of consequences go along with those. People will oftentimes favor those because they think that the chemicals and the, the chemical agrochemical companies uh, producing these chemicals are bad for the environment, but at least the chemical companies are doing testing to document um, to what extent these uh, products, uh, how they function in the environment. These home remedies have no uh, knowledge, no environmental um, descriptions about what happens when you apply that to the ground. And they also don't have any ideas about efficacy. So you either, um, let's say, on the off chance that they would actually work, um, you don't know how much to use. So. Um, at all cost, avoid using home remedies. Okay, just a couple of quick pictures so you can see how these um, might play out. We have selective mechanical. We're going back to that uh, four square grid that I showed earlier. Um, uh, mechanical hand pulling, you see some uh, youth in Shenango County, as I recall, hand pulling. Um, 
bush honeysuckle. One of the characteristics of hand pulling in large areas is you have large patches of disturbed soil to the extent that there are some other species that benefits from exposed mineral soil. Um, you're creating good conditions. Now the question is whether the species that responds is desirable or undesirable. Uh, then a, um, a, another example of selective mechanical is flame weeding. So this is the wand of a flame torch and this is a, I was just doing a, a little trial on American hornbeam uh, near my office at the Arnott Forest to see how flame weeding worked on American hornbeam. It works quite well. And, uh, but it's a selective mechanical. Here's selective chemical. Uh, so we're using a chemical treatment and we're applying it to a target plant. In the left corner we have a basal bark treatment. Uh, this is a Garlon 4 being applied to American Beach. Here's a foliar treatment. Um, could, be, could be any number of things applied to um, clumps of shrubs, and here is a cut stump or cut surface treatment. The pesticide disclaimer is that any pesticide, every pesticide that you buy is, is regulated ultimately through the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. The EPA transfers responsibility, I believe, in every state to the state environmental agency, whatever that might be. <clears throat> every one of those pesticide containers and Herbicides are a type of pesticide that are applied to vegetation. Fungicides are applied to fungi. Rodenticides are applied to rodents. Uh, insecticides are applied to insects. And uh, herbicides are to control insects. Uh, herbicides are to control vegetation or herbaceous material. Every one of these pesticides has a label. The label is the law. When you use it, when you buy and use that product, the expectation is that you have read the label and you are following the label. And if the label says you're supposed to wear nitrile gloves and safety glasses, then you should be wearing, and long sleeves, then you should be wearing all of those things. Uh, and some of them specify that you need to have rubber boots. Others do not. And it's going to vary a little bit from state to state. Uh, in New York, some great information is available. Cornell does the contracts, the pesticide education uh, with the state agency. And here are a couple of websites. That lower website, the PIMS website, is a place that you can go and, and find all of the labels for all of the pesticides that are legally registered for use in New York. So if you want to find out uh, something about a product before you buy it, this is a good place to do it. Um, anybody can use that. The, the caveat I'll offer is that some states vary a little bit in, um, in, in their label restrictions. So the, the, in New York tends to be more restrictive than most other states. Um, so you can, you can go to this, uh, anybody could go to that site, and you could pull up the label for Accord Concentrate or for 2,4-D or Garlon 4 or Pathfinder 2 or whatever, pick whatever chemical it is you think you want to use. You can read about it. You can, you can learn what the personal protective equipment is that you need. Um, you can get an idea of, of the different concentrations that it comes available in um, you can, you can learn a lot um, rather than standing in the hardware store or the farm store trying to read the label, which tends to be very fine print when it shows up on the side of the package. OK, uh, broadcast mechanical. Here is a uh, couple of examples. We have goats. Those of you who we were talking about goats earlier, um, and uh, you could, those of you that are familiar with goats would quickly and rightfully argue that Goats are not broadcast mechanical, they are selective mechanical. Um, and goats do have, I think all livestock have preferential browsing habits. There are some species they like better than others. If you put them in, in a large enough um, number of animals, high enough stocking rate, uh, they, will, they will more likely impact all of the vegetation than if you put them in at a low stocking rate. Another example of broadcast mechanical in the bottom corner is this fecon. This is basically a skid steer. Uh, we, we saw this at the Silvopasture conference last week in Watkins Glen. And it's a, functionally a skid steer on tracks. 
out on the front end it has a rotary head it's you know picture a a, um, a rolling pin with with you know very large carbide tipped I think teeth and it it essentially goes it picks a tree or a clump or a shrub and it grinds it up and pulverizes it you can see that on the right this is an area um, on the farm we visited in Watkins Glen where the fecon had worked earlier in the summer and you can see in the background what the understory did look like and here's what happens after the fecon goes through it gives it a, a mulching action it churns up the surface of the soil um, and the, depending upon the skill of the operator, you know, they can, he's, this particular operator is very nimble. He charges, I think, $150 per operating hour. Um, there are other machines, hydro axes and things like that, that are a little less expensive. Uh, the difference is that they don't, <clears throat> they don't churn up and incorporate the, the, the dead material um, into a mulch um, as nicely as the fecon does. Those, I think, um, Brett Chedzoy, this was his farm. He's creating silvopasture. Uh, the, 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 the fecon operator was charging, I think, $150 per operating hour. Some of the hydroax work he's had done in the past was $110 per hour. Some of you may have some other experiences with prices. Feel free to, to share those in the chat pod. And I see that Carol points out that what comes in after the area is cleared is very important. That's absolutely correct. You can you, know, you can get rid of one problem and bring in another maybe worse problem. So you need to have a plan in place to, to control um, propagule distribution and arrival and um, dominance by desired species. And then finally, broadcast chemical. Um, these are, tend to be ground-based systems. Um, in the olden days, they'd do aerial applications. I think maybe in some areas they still do that, but it's not as common as it was. So most in, in New York, most of the um, you know, most of the the broadcast chemical is ground based. Jeff wants to know how much of an area can the fecon clear in an hour. Um, it, it depends, of course, on the not on the abundance of vegetation, but on the size of the vegetation. So if it's fairly small diameter stems, one inch, two inch, three inch, I think that it can it can do an acre, maybe slightly more than an acre in an hour. Um, when it, when you get into the a larger diameter material like you see here, you know, some of these trees that it was trying to take down were six inch diameter trees. And the way it does that is it, is it raises the boom arm up and it, it bumps the tree as high as it can reach it. And as the tree comes down, it grinds up the tree as it's coming down. And then the fecon works down the stem until it gets down to the root collar and then it grinds up the root collar. So a bigger tree is going to take more time. What what the owner did in this case was that he marked some of the larger trees and he's going to go in and cut those for firewood or just he may do a chemical girdle, um, do something so that it's a more cost efficient use of his time and cost efficient use of the fecon's time. So, uh, and I don't have the contact information for this individual, but if somebody's interested, and I don't know how far he'll travel. Um, but send me an email, and I'll be happy to put you in touch. His name is uh, Charlie Roth, I think, R-O-T-H. And I'm sure there are other people. I'm not trying to necessarily plug Charlie over other folks. I'm sure there are others of these around, although um, you know, it's not, there's not a fecon in, in every backyard. OK, the, um, so we've talked about, I, I hope I've built a foundation for thinking about working with um, invasive vegetation, invasive plants, interfering plants, the framework to think about how to manage them that I'm a strong advocate of is this concept of integrated vegetation management. And this is, I, as I think about vegetation management, I think, you know, it's not just a matter, there's a, there's a, a tendency for, for all of us to say, you know, I want to just, you know, go in and, and treat it. Whatever it is, I, I think I have a problem. I'm going to go in and whatever tool I have that's most easily accessible, that's the tool I'm going to use. And that not, that's not necessarily the best way to go. Um, th there should be a deliberate process. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, the, the goal of integrated vegetation management, I've, I developed this. So I kind of worked through this not knowing that some other people had already worked through it. And I'll 
which we'll talk about those in just a minute. But when I worked there, I thought about integrated pest management. And so I said, well, what are the principles of integrated pest management that would apply to managing vegetation? And there are four basic features. You have to understand the have to first be able to identify, clearly identify the plants that you're trying to manage. Uh, if you can't do that, don't, don't go any further until you learn how to identify them. Then understand their biology and ecology. It may be that, that the, the solution, once you understand their, weak, their weaknesses, their Achilles tendon, is um, easier than you think. You need to be able to measure the extent of the problem. Is this a problem that, that occurs in isolated patches on five acres, or is this a problem that occurs on 100% of the area on 40 acres? Uh, could be the same plant, but because of the extent of the problem, you're going to pick two very different tools. Uh, the third item is you need to recognize some desired level of control. In some rare circumstances, some of these invasive species, undesirable species, we can strive to completely eradicate. In most cases, in per completely and permanently eradicate. Um, maybe that's redundant to say that for eradicate. But uh, in, in many cases, though, there's so much of this plant in the environment. A, a case in point is my wife and I own a woodlot in the uh, eastern side of the Adirondacks. Uh, I have, uh, throughout my property, I have um, scattered little shin high and ankle high and knee high sprigs of, of European buckthorn. And I go around and I pull those out. And I when I look across the road, my neighbor has um, dozens of large and down the hedgerow um, off my property down the road, and there are dozens of these large, heavily fruited European buckthorns. I'm going to spend the rest of my life picking buckthorn sprouts, but it's just the way I've decided to do it. I'm feeling like I can keep ahead of it if I pay attention. We've trained our daughters to recognize um, those. And so the desired level of control there is we're just kind of a low level. We want to stay ahead of these plants before they become fruiting on our property. The tool in that case that we're using is selective mechanical. The cost to that is that it takes me some extra time, but it seems like you know the best strategy. There are, there are a variety of costs. Um, costs for the treatment, costs because of the impact on the land, cost to the environment, cost to the people doing the doing the treatment. So you know some things you can say, well, you know I I want to do use a mechanical treatment, but it's maybe it's dangerous. It's physically demanding to go out and and um, thrash around in that brush. And we'll see some examples of that when we talk about um, multiflora rose and. Um, Barberry. So think about all this. I mentioned there's an article on my forest, Cornell Forest Connect.ning site, and uh, that article talks about in detail about some of those costs. So other folks, unbeknownst to me, have uh, thought a lot more about integrated vegetation management. Um, this is the tree care industry, and these are essentially the people that manage uh, power line rights of ways, and they have a um, an ANSI uh, standard, uh, the Part 7 for Integrated Vegetation Management. I've, I've um, ordered a copy of the standard. I haven't received it yet. But it looks like, and without going into the details, it looks like their, their uh, six-step process is uh, similar in principle to what I've described um, when I think about vegetation management. So I've put the, the website there, the treecareindustry.org, um, and uh, if this is something you're interested in, you can send me an email or, or grab a copy of this link. Okay, now let's jump into some species. We're, uh, we're 40 minutes in. We've talked a lot about kind of the framework of thinking about things, but let's look at, I have, um, I added three new species. The, the last time I gave this presentation as a webinar was three years ago. I've modified it a, f a fair amount and added three new species. It was an hour long then, so... Um, I've taken out a few things as well, but um, we're going we're gonna to scoot right along here. The, I'll just say that the commonality in many of these invasive plants and all of these, I think all the ones I'm talking about here and managing are, are non-natives. So, uh, but all of them tend to be self-inflicted. You know, these are things that we as a society brought into our culture for any number of reasons. This is for medicinal and um, culinary purposes. 
if you will, uh, and many of them seem to have arrived in the mid-1800s. So garlic mustard uh, is, uh, is the first one we'll talk about. It's a biennial plant, so we'll talk, in each case, we'll talk a little bit about the biology of the plant. Think about where you might find some weak spots in the biology and, and how you might use that to your advantage. So it's a biennial, which means it lives for two years. The first year, it shows up as a what's called a basal rosette. It's a dark green. It comes out early in the spring, usually before the spring ephemerals come up, and it survives later um, than the other plants in the fall. So you've got this um, uh, unique green um, hue in the landscape where you have garlic mustard. The second year it produces its fruiting stock um, and it fruits. Uh, it has the photosynthetic cycle of garlic mustard, as I recall, starts fairly early in the spring. It produces abundantly over the growing season and then tails off later in the year. So it's, it's got it grows throughout the entirety of the summer growing season. As with all of these very profound um, reproductive output uh, up to a hundred thousand seeds per square meter. So you think about a square meter and a hundred thousand seeds. Um, let's say you only get uh, fifty thousand seeds per square meter, and you only get ten percent germination, and only five percent of those survive to flower. You're still talking about thousands and thousands of plants per acre, and you can have areas that are are more dense than this. The other downside is that it has a seed bank. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Here's some more pictures. This lower picture is from a, a roadside in Pennsylvania. Uh, garlic mustard can dominate the understory to the exclusion of other species. Uh, it tends to be more productive where you have increases in sunlight and increases in soil moisture. Um, uh, but it, but that's not to say it's not limited under most conditions, although it does have some report of being sensitive to drought. Unfortunately, we can't control the onset of drought, and so drought doesn't really work as a tool. All right, so how do we, and I mentioned it has a seed bank. Uh, the seed bank is a problem where we were for the species that have a seed bank year when you make a commitment to manage in it you're making a commitment for potentially several years to managing that uh, particularly if you're using mechanical treatments because you mechanical treatments I'm not aware of any that are going to have a strong effect on uh, seed banks you know, people talk about prescribed fires I'm not a, I've not I don't remember reading anywhere where prescribed fire has controlled a seed bank Mechanically, this is, uh, if you have enough hands per acre, uh, you can mechanically go in and pull all these plants. Uh, you pull them before the flowering heads develop. Uh, if you pull them before the flowers develop, you can leave them on the ground. If the flowers have started to develop, you need to put the plants in the plastic bags. Otherwise, those flowers will ripen. Um, the flowers will ripen and will, uh, will disperse seeds even though they're pulled up. Um, Dick says, okay, uh, I'll, let me come to these questions after I finish up with Elaria before I move on. Um, other mechanical treatments, uh, you can mow, so go in with a weed whacker and mow off the plants. Any desirable plants that are mixed in, so that mowing, remember, is going to be a broadcast treatment. So if you have an occasional maple seedling or trillium or orchid that's mixed in with your garlic mustard, you're, you stand the risk of, of lopping the top off of those. Uh, so you need to decide what level of, of impact you're willing to endure. From the chemical uh, treatment side, uh, glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, is, is highly effective on garlic mustard. So I'm told I've never done this treatment. Uh, and the beauty of using this, you can use a very dilute solution, a 1% solution as a foliar treatment. Uh, you do it early in the spring or late in the fall after all the other, either before the other plants have leafed out or after the other plants have senesced. You can then um, essentially select because of that you've, you've isolated the timing of it. You can have almost a selective uh, chemical treatment. Uh, glyphosate has no soil activity, so that kind of a treatment would not have any effect on senesced plants or plants that have not yet emerged. I will point out that there is um, 
some evidence, Baron Blossy, who's a professor in our department of natural resources, uh, was gave a presentation earlier this week, and he said that he's he has evidence for self-induced population declines of of garlic mustard, and. Um, so what that means is after a number of years, the plants have created a condition that they can no longer survive in, and the population crashes. Um, he's not published that, but he is he feels um, strongly about that. And his recommendation is if you have garlic mustard, ignore it for 15 years and it goes away. And I guess if you have 15 years to wait, then that's a good strategy. But if you have um, a vigorous population and you want something else growing, then uh, that wait waited out strategy probably won't work for you. Okay, a couple of questions. Carol has wisteria. Um, uh, right, and some of these plants, she says vigilant, some of these plants um, can get away from you. Uh, most people don't have the attentiveness to take care of them. So, um, and, and many of the horticultural plants are now trying to come out with have um, our uh, our um, propagated in such a way that they're sterile. Um, or, but be careful, some of them are almost sterile, and so they may only have a 5% reproductive capacity. Well, if you had planted some garlic mustard that had a 5% reproductive capacity based on 100,000 seeds per square meter, you still have a lot of, of plants. So these, the invasive plants, even though they may have a, re if they're sold horticulturally and marketed as having a reduced reproductive output, they still can be a very reproductively successful plant. Dick wants to know how big the garlic mustard uh, basil rosette leaves are. There, I'll say there in the, I'm going to ruler here. Oh, you know, they're they're probably in the two inch diameter range. Go to just that's a good good um, segue. Go look online for garlic mustard management, and you'll find fact sheets from the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service and the Soil, uh, maybe Soil and Water Districts, NRCS, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service there, and, and pick five of those, read them all, and you'll have, by, by looking at where they overlap and align and thinking about your circumstances, you'll come up with a lot of good characteristics, good strategies. Uh, seed bank means stripping an area. Needs to be checked uh, after for continuing management. Yes, so that the plants produce seeds, the seeds reside and survive in the soil. Garlic mustard has three to five years. Other species we'll talk about in just a minute don't last for more than a year. Some species like raspberry and pin cherry may last for 80 years in the soil. So the, each plant species is going to differ in its in its uh, seed bank potential. And what that means is even though you've controlled what you can see, there are propagules that are waiting and able to respond to that increase um, growing space. All right, next species. Um, Lanicera is the genus. The common name is bush honeysuckle. There are three common bush honeysuckles, Amur, Maros, and Tarshan. They occur essentially throughout the northeastern United States. Um, and I have never made any effort to try to identify those. And this is not a presentation on identification. I, I'll probably do a webinar sometime next year on identification of invasive shrubs because there's a lot of cool um, taxonomic features to talk about. We're not getting into that here. Um, it's just the encouragement is that you need to, if you're going to be managing this or other species, identify it. This is a great example of the need to identify it because, as you see in the in the bottom edge of the screen, a picture of the native honeysuckle, the fly honeysuckle, which is in the genus Deravilla. Very distinct differences, but if you look at them quickly, you say, you know, okay, this is similarity. This is this is a honeysuckle, or somebody says I've got honeysuckle, and so you go out and spray it, or plow it, or burn it, or whatever. Turn your goats in there. Um, some of these native species, Deravilla is not, to my knowledge, rare. Uh, it's not overly common. I think it's probably browsed pretty heavily by deer, but the. Um, uh, you need to be able to identify what it is you're working with. So, Lanicera, uh, some of the differences, I'll just kind of hit on some of the differences as we're going through here. Remember with garlic mustard, you had 
a year to get ahead of it. Right? It had one year as a basal rosette. The second year it's producing seed. With bush honeysuckle, you have five to eight years. And some of the plants in more shaded conditions may, may be on the longer end of that scale. Very beautiful, attractive foliage and fruit. Um, I personally think this is aesthetically quite attractive, um, but it has, uh, it has a, an ability to dominate and overwhelm a forest understory. Again, very high reproductive output. Uh, 20,000 flowers, up to 20,000 flowers per plant and up to six seeds per flower. So an individual bush, look at this bush here, put that into full flower production and that individual plant's going to throw out 120,000 seeds. Um, it's unlikely that it has a seed bank. So that's to our advantage or whoever's managing it to your advantage. You control the above ground portions um, and, you can con and you control the areas nearby that are producing the seed. Um, you can bring this under control maybe within a year or two. Uh, the problem with this, other than the, its ability to exclude other species, birds that he didn't, everybody likes birds, um, although I'll point out it's the birds that spread a lot of these invasive shrubs around. Um, when they, the, the fat content of bush honeysuckle fruit is apparently quite low, or lower than the fat content of native plant, native shrub fruits. The migratory birds or non-migratory birds that fill up on bush honeysuckle have a lower nutritional foundation as they head south to Cancun for the winter. So those some of those some of those birds may be in a in a depauper nutritional condition heading out. Uh, the architecture of the plant also uh, makes nests within honeysuckle uh, more likely to be predated. Okay, how do we manage it? Bill, you'll recognize that fellow in the upper right-hand corner. Um, uh, mechanical methods uh, work pretty well. There's a, um, a tool called a weed wrench or a root wrench um, the, uh, that, that works well. It's a, it's a lever bar that grips the bottom of the plant and you can wrench it out. Most of these invasive shrubs are shallow rooted, so they come out pretty easily. Even fairly large plants come out pretty well. Repeated cutting, particularly in the shade, works well. It's repeated because if you cut it just once, it sprouts. It sprouts vigorously, lives off that root system, so repeated cutting depletes the root system. Flame weeding, and that's what you see this device here in the upper corner. Flame weeding uh, is an effective way to control um, Honeysuckle, the research I did with that found that a double flame event or fairly early in the year resulted in, I think, about 80% control, so 80% non-re-sprouting. And you can do combinations where you do a flame treatment once, let it re-sprout, and then do a foliar, uh, foliar herbicide so that you... Um, you don't, you're not spraying as much of the plant, uh, and so you're using that. That would be an integrated strategy. Chemical strategies also work, whether it's a, a foliar treatment or a cut stump treatment. You can see in the bottom picture somebody here with some um, latex gloves applying um, a chemical to a freshly cut surface. I, I haven't seen any research on this, but I'll, I'll suggest that if you're going to be whether cutting or spraying, doing a cut stump or pulling it, don't put these into huge piles and burn them if you can avoid it. Uh, it, it may be advantageous to leave these clumps um, scattered but clustered in such a way that, that they provide some uh, protection to seedlings, desirable tree seedlings, and inhibit some of the deer activity. Okay, Japanese barberry. Here's a nice thick patch of Japanese barberry. If you're not familiar with the stem, it has a thorn on it or a pair of thorns um, and is, uh, is an uncomfortable experience to walk through a, a heavy patch of that. There's both American native and European barberry. The European barberry is the one that's, that's invasive. Um, partly because of the definition. It's non-native, but also because of its characteristics. Um, this is a valuable horticultural industry. It's millions of dollars in Connecticut annually. So this is the, the pressure to find ways to continue to propagate not just this plant, but other plants um, can be quite large. Uh, there are a number of different um, control treatments. The, many of the ones we talked about for uh, bush honeysuckle would apply here as well. For those of you that have an interest in controlling 
um, Japanese Barberry, I'll refer you to a webinar. We had a, a full one hour talking about Japanese Barberry. Jeff Ward, who's a silviculturalist in Connecticut at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, um, colleagues of his, Tom Ward and Scott Williams, um, have done an enormous amount of work on how to manage Japanese Barberry using organic and chemical and integrated organic chemical techniques. So we won't spend time on that. Tree of Heaven. This is uh, this is a I'll say it's a fun tree, and I mean that with um, kind of a twinkle in my eye. It's it's fun in an interesting botanical sort of way because it's incredible growth rate. Um, but that said, it has um, lots of problems that go along with it. This is I think the first plant that I realized plants can be uh, problematic. I remember I went to forestry school um, at Purdue University in Indiana. I remember a spot walking along the sidewalk and somebody had cut down a large ailanthus or tree of heaven um, in the in the corridor between the sidewalk and the road. And by the end of the, I watched this, the sprouts from the stump grow. And by the end of the summer, the tree was about three inches in diameter and over 12 feet tall. So it's just, just an amazing sort of um, amazing uh, growth potential. Uh, Betsy talks about the honeysuckle pop, popper. Um, and uh, that came up in the noon hour. Thank you, uh, Betsy, for sharing that. So, uh, Honey, not honeysuckle, tree of heaven. Uh, here's uh, here's an example of why you don't want to leave your vehicles parked too long in your backyard. Um, this is uh, some some of you could argue that that truck's not worth saving, but if you had something you're trying to save it, you've got this would be a challenging uh, felling operation, I think, at this point. Uh, honeysuckle, or I call it honeysuckle, tree of heaven, Elanthus has an incredible vegetative capacity. Uh, this is one of those that I would I would discourage someone from trying to use a mechanical method to control this. I think any kind of the mechanical treatments, cutting or burning, um, grubbing, are really just going to stimulate root suckering, and you're going to end up with more stems per acre. Uh, they may be smaller in size, and maybe that's your objective. Maybe your objective is to reduce the height of the plants, and so you have a brush hog, and you go out and you brush hog this area two or three times a summer, and that's fine, and that, that may be satisfactory, but to control it and to limit its presence, um, a chemical strategy is going to be important. I've listed several chemicals here, and in all of these, I just what I've done is I've gone into these fact sheets from the um, National Park Service or the Fish and Wildlife Service or Nature Conservancy and extracted the recommendations. Um, in most cases, I've not worked directly with a lot of these species. My encouragement is you just go in, go online, find those fact sheets, and, and do, the, do the research yourself. Talk to a forester in the area that's familiar with these. I've starred imazapyr because some of these chemicals, imazapyr, for example, have, root act, have soil activity, and you can get movement from your target plant to non-target plants. And so be careful um, where you spray some of these. Glyphosate does not have soil activity. Triclopyr does not have soil activity. Okay, let's uh, catch up on a couple of questions here. So Betsy mentioned the honeysuckle popper. Um, University of Maine. I almost went to the University of Maine. My forest, my family's from Maine. Um, Steve talks about wind dispersal of Elanthus is impressive. It is. It produces hundreds of thousands of seeds, um, and they spread. They spread widely. Okay, um, Iliagnus umbellata, autumn olive. This is a plant that's a nitrogen fixer. It comes in quite readily in old pastures. You can see the lower picture is a, a dense clump of this. Uh, the upper upper picture is could be taken in any um, uh, rural landscape where you're succeeding from fields to forest, and you see all those little scattered clumps out there are autumn olive, and there are many examples of this in central New York where you see these scattered plants and then over the years the the plants uh, populations expand the the canopy coalesces and then pretty soon you have an area that's not physically um, penetrable 
Um, and this is, you know, we talk about some of the costs. This is a place I would not want to send a person in, you know, somebody that worked for me or somebody that I'm hiring. I just wouldn't feel comfortable to send them in there and say, here's a backpack sprayer um, or a, a backpack sprayer or a flamethrower. Uh, and flame weeding is very effective on, on autumn olive, but I don't think that's an area that you can really safely work. So you need to find some other strategies to work through this. Hand pulling works. Um, this forms a my experience is it forms a better root system than something like honeysuckle. Um, glyphosate, the, the active ingredient in Roundup, uh, works pretty well um, as reported for foliage as well as cut stumps. Flame works. This is the one species where a single flame event I found had pretty good control. Repeated, um, repeated uh, cutting will also work. You deplete the root system. Okay, multiflora rose. This is one I think I think everybody I talk to almost knows multiflora rose. Um, again, it dates back to the mid 1800s. It was used as as rootstock for grafts for the rose horticultural industry, um, and also as a living fence. Um, it's common in open fields as well as in shady open woods. Um, I, it'll, it sprouts very aggressively when you cut it in full sunlight. Um, it does not, to my knowledge, root sprout. I have heard or read that if you put the, the long tips down um, in contact with the soil, that those will form roots and form a new plant. Uh, it's typically a shrub, but I have seen it growing as a vine. Some of you have also seen it. You, know, you get it 20 or 25 feet up into the tree. I didn't put any of those pictures in here, but it's it's almost scary when you see those um, so big. Uh, control treatments, uh, repeated mowing will work. If you have a brush hog and it's in your pasture, just keep mowing it and eventually you'll deplete it. Uh, the same thing will work. Anything where you have repeated mowing, if you have livestock that can get in and, gra and graze it in there and it's palatable to the livestock, then that will, um, that's a, they're essentially the same types of control. Foliar treatments or cut stump treatments will work, and flame weeding seems to be effective if the clumps are, are shaded. Clumps that are in full sunlight, uh, flame weeding, a double flame event doesn't work. That's all. The research I've done has only been with double flame events. You could probably go back you know, three times a year for two or three years and knock it back, but I, that just didn't seem um, particularly practical. Okay, buckthorn. Ramnus cathartica. We're going to talk about two buckthorns. This is European buckthorn. Um, it also is kind of an attractive plant. It has um, dark berries. Um, note though the, the scientific name cathartica should be uh, closely recognized because of the effects it'll have on you. Um, and uh, identification-wise, and because we're going to talk about the other buckthorn, it's, it's worth mentioning this. Notice that the foliage is what's called sub-opposite, so the leaves are, are paired, but they're not directly opposite each other as in the maples, for example. The venation is an arcuate venation, so the veins curve from the midrib. They move towards the margin and then curve towards the apex of the leaf. The margin of the leaf, though, is serrate, so it has serrate leaf margins. Uh, oftentimes, there is a thorn on the terminal end of the twig. Um, buckthorn is, oh, I guess that's our only slide. So buckthorn is um, supposedly works with prescribed fire. I would guess that that would be where you have a buckthorn population of seedlings and a heavy litter layer and you're able to get a hot fire. I've never done any work with prescribed fire. The work that um, uh, Bill LaPointe and I did, Bill's a research cooperator using flame weeding on his buckthorn, uh, we found um, pretty good levels of sprouting and that that was characteristic in with two other cooperators with buckthorn. If you cut buckthorn, it sprouts very aggressively. Now, as I recall, Bill said some of those plants that had sprouted subsequently died. Um, but my, my sense is that that flame weeding is not going to be an effective tool for managing buckthorn, um, at least not with uh, just two flame events. Uh, chemicals would be uh, a more effective strategy. Mile a minute is a plant. We're at 8 o'clock, so I'm going to try and uh, crank this up. I'm talking more than I thought I would. Mile a minute, um, 
uh, Persicaria perfoliata is a twining vine. It's an annual vine. It has a blue berry-like fruit. Uh, it's common in open and disturbed areas. You can see what it does a little bit here as a vine. And then it also, uh, you can see here, has an even more expansive capacity to climb up into trees mile a minute because it grows very fast. Uh, the, the bright spot in, in the control is that there is a weevil. Uh, weevil has differential success depending upon habitat conditions. Uh, but the weevils are, uh, in, and this is some research, um, drawing a blank on the uh, researcher's name from, I can't even think, Delaware or University of Delaware, Rhode Island. Um, Dr. Hugh Goldstein, who's an uh, entomologist, worked with this and been able to establish, successfully establish some breeding populations of the weevil in some circumstances. Mechanical will work. Uh, notice that the plant has thorns, so hand pulling is possible, but you need some uh, gloves. Uh, there's been some work with pre-emergent herbicides, and I talked about this at the noon hour. There was a, a herbicide specialist from Penn State that had reported that oust XP works as a pre-emergent herbicide in March to control mile a minute, and post-emergent uh, foliar herbicides have also been um, um, post-emergent foliar herbicides also work. Okay, swallowwort is one that's uh, fairly new in New York, and I won't say new, but it's uh, newly hit the big leagues in New York in the last five or eight years. Um, uh, Vincatoxicum is the genus. There's a pale species and a black species, Rosicum or Nigrum, um, uh, renamed from a previous genus. This is uh, dominates it's called dog strangling vine, um, apparently toxic to wildlife, uh, and and can dominate an area. Uh, a problem with with the um, with the plant ecologically is it serves as a false host for monarch butterflies. So the, the larvae will emerge on black swallowwort, but will not survive on black swallowwort. Um, mowing is not effective because it has a uh, great capacity for resprouting. If you're going to control it manually, you have to get down into the soil and destroy the root crown. Um, all of these treatments, mechanical or chemical, may require multiple entries. This is an area, um, another one of my research cooperators north of, a little bit north of Ithaca, that had a small patch on the edge of his pasture. We sprayed it with Garlon 4, uh, had pretty good kill, uh, treated some, some patches where it had jumped out into the pasture, some hot spots. You can see where we treated it. And we'll be going back in in the spring to see to what extent uh, there's a seed bed that comes up or that those root crowns continued to sprout. OK, this is one of the new ones I've added, not and one that I've just um, identified, not identified, that I first gained exposure to uh, in June of this year, Japanese stiltgrass, Microstegium viminium. Uh, this is an Asiatic species, as you can imagine. It can uh, very um, aggressively dominate an area. It, it's uh, more aggressive uh, and outcompetes garlic mustard. Uh, so the, the previous um, energy that went into garlic mustard, there's been some more recent research that says we have these two species together. The, um, the Japanese tilt grass is likely to win out. Um, an important note here is that the seeds tend to be small and reportedly gravity dispersed. Um, so that gives us some clues about how we want to try to manage it. Um, it has all of the same, I'll say, bad traits that the other plants have. It reduces biodiversity. It reduces the growth rates of, of, of species that it occurs with. Um, and it has uh, negative impacts on some of the soil chemistry properties. Uh, mechanical controls will work. Uh, you need to be persistent with them. It's an annual plant, drop seeds. Uh, so the, the, the treatment should happen before the plant set the seeds. Um, I don't recall to what extent this has a seed bank. I, uh, 
I have to scroll back. I think it, it does have a seed bank, at least for a few years. Um, the uh, pre- and post-emergent herbicides worked better than just the post-emergent herbicides, uh, which worked better than hand weeding and reducing subsequent spring emergence. Um, however, depending upon what you used uh, with consistent work, this was work done by Flory in 2008, hand weeding resulted in uh, as much as a 50% increase in the resident plant or the native plant community. Uh, uh, th those native species also had increases in percent cover. So again, you know, we're trying to mix and match and find out what level of control we want and, and how we're going to um, restore that habitat um, picking and choosing our uh, treatments carefully. Uh, herbicidal controls, uh, Karen Judge and colleagues in the southeast, uh, I'll say North Carolina or Virginia, have done a lot of work with this. Um, all of the chemicals that they worked with, and they used uh, chemicals that were labeled for crabgrass, which I'm not familiar with, all of them worked, um, worked quite well. Glyphosate also worked pretty well. Um, they also found that when they did a half, uh, half dose treatment um, uh, using post-emergent herbicides, they had significant reductions in biomass. They weren't sure if that reduction in biomass was enough to also translate into a reduction in seed production. So that's, that's some research that remains to be done. So because of the, um, the limited spreadability of Japanese stiltgrass, I think it's, it's prudent. This is a, a good situation in some respects. If you don't already have a problem, if you're going into an area, you know you're going to do some kind of a disturbance treatment. This is a species that responds very favorably to disturbance. Uh, disturbed litter layers are, um, are highly successfully colonized by Japanese stiltgrass according to the literature. And so if you're going to have some kind of a disturbance, whether it's a logging activity or you're putting in a road culvert or something like that, check the area for, for uh, Japanese stiltgrass. You don't need to look a mile away. You can look in the general vicinity, control it before you have the disturbance, um, and then monitor that disturbed site in case there's any seed that has become established there. So focus on equipment, focus on road construction, um, mechanical efforts are effective but require a sustained effort. Um, and chemical co controls will also work, uh, but try and work the timing of it. The, the chemicals are effective uh, late in the growing season before seed set, uh, and you, so you may be able to miss some of your early spring ephemerals and still um, capture some treatment and controls. Okay, this is the other buckthorn. Um, I knew it um, originally in the genus Ramnus. It's now been uh, repositioned into the genus Frangula aldness. This is uh, glossy buckthorn, uh, common on wet sites. Uh, the differences that you see are that it has, it does like uh, European buckthorn, has arcuate venation, but the leaf margin is entire. The bud is naked, and the foliage uh, tends to be more alternate than it does sub-opposite. Um, a third characteristic, so the entire leaf margin, naked bud, um, alternate, more or less alternate foliage is three to the fourth. Uh, the, the fruits will, will phase from a green to a red to a black. Uh, European buckthorn goes from green to black. Um, so if you have a buckthorn and it, and it has this red uh, red color developing as the fruit is maturing, then it's probably frangula, um, not Ramnus cathartica. Uh, Ramnus fr uh, frangula ulnus has lenticels, as does Ramnus cathartica. This is a wetland species. Uh, it starts off as a multi-stemmed shrub and will develop into a 20-foot tall single-stemmed or multi-stemmed small tree. Uh, very prolific vegetative response to disturbance. Uh, so, um, and also in terms of managing this, uh, both chemical and mechanical treatments uh, were not found to be particularly successful. And I've, I've learned and I need to find the name of the person. There's somebody that's done a lot of work with managing buckthorn and has apparently had good success. When I find that, I'll put that up on that uh, Cornell Forest Connect site. 
Uh, but right now, it seems like the best recommendations I could find uh, involve integrating repeated mechanical and chemical treatments. Okay, I see that there's some questions and comments. Um, I'm going to let those sit for now, and let me just get through this presentation, um, and then we'll. Um, I've got I've got all evening, so um, uh, we'll, we'll. But I want to get through this in the interest of time for you all that maybe have something else to do. Salastris orbiculatus um, is uh, Oriental bittersweet. It's a non-native, um, and to contrast that with the native um, uh, Scandens, uh, which is fairly uncommon and becoming more uncommon. Uh, so you'd want to be particularly careful if you're managing uh, Oriental bittersweet that you're not managing native bittersweet. Native bittersweet, the flowers are terminal, so the flowers would occur only at the terminal ends of the branches uh, versus uh, orbiculatus where you have uh, flowers that happen at the axles of the leaves um, and so you'd have flowers and fruit along the entire length of the stem. The leaves on orbiculatus tend to be almost as broad, as wide as they are long, versus scandens where the leaves are twice as long typically as they are broad. Bright, very attractive fruit, which is why this was planted uh, for cut flower arrangements and also for wildlife. But you can see that it has almost a kudzu-like effect uh, growing up. This is a picture from the south where it has uh, grown up into these trees. It can kill the trees. Uh, it can weight the trees down, it can accumulate snow and ice loads and break the trees off. This picture on the left is from an area just east of Ithaca where um, all of these trees, at least in this area that are pictured, have um, oriental bittersweet uh, growing up them, also intermixed with poison ivy. For those of you that are looking closely, you'll recognize poison ivy in the understory. Um, here's some of the biological characteristics. I mentioned a couple of National Park Service has a nice fact sheet on this, and the Fire Effects Information System of the Forest Service has some good information. Uh, Oriental bittersweet's hypothesized to be one of the fastest spreading invasive species. It's, it tends to be most common in New York and Connecticut. Uh, I've learned this morning that it's also fairly common, at least in parts of Maine. So if, if you're hearing about this near where you are, then be attentive to it. I found it on our property in the eastern Adirondacks. They show up as, as nondescript, almost um, uh, non-apparent little three and four inch seedlings. And then in an area where I did a, a two acre wildlife opening, they took off like gangbusters. So they're very responsive to increases in sunlight, although they are tolerant of shade. They're very effective sprouters. So even though I go through and I pull up my little seedlings of um, Asiatic bittersweet, if I leave root fragments, as it says in the next to the last bullet, uh, many of those may end up re-sprouting again. But it still feels good to pull them up, so I'll, I'll probably continue to do that. And Betsy's saying here that it's that the bittersweet's common in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, as I was doing this background, you know, the the reading for this, the Oriental bittersweet, the Microstegium, um, and the uh, Frangula were all reported in my taxonomic manual, uh, which was written. Uh, I bought it in the mid '80s, and it was. Uh, probably 1970s version, reported all of these species as being present, but as isolated localized clumps. So we've, we've had spread, and that spread has built up a seed potential and um, of reproductive parents, and now I think we're in a, in a very fast expansion phase. Okay, managing uh, oriental bittersweet, and somebody was asking about this earlier, um, hand pulling will work if you have enough hands per acre, but you need to be attentive to getting the entire root system. Uh, it can form large diameter uh, stems. So if you have those large diameter stems and they're way up in the tree, don't bother trying to yank that um, that uh, vine system out of the tree. I, I guess in most cases you wouldn't be successful. It sounds pretty dangerous as well. Uh, better yet, just uh, cut the plant with, you could use a handsaw, and then uh, treat the surface of that with either glyphosate or triclopyr, so a Roundup product or a Garlon product. 
foliar treatments are recommended with uh, triclip here. Um, I saw a report also that if you have low dense patches, you can do a cut stubble. Uh, cut stubble means that you cut it with a brush hog or something like that, and then come into a broadcast uh, full broadcast uh, chemical treatment with something like Roundup or Triclip here. So Jeff says it's common in Western Mass. So this is um, this is a species that is um, has a has a I think a pretty good footprint in um, the northeastern U.S. and and to the south as well. We don't want to leave our, our friends in the south out. So here's a flame weeding sun. We've talked a lot about flaming. Uh, Bill Appoint was, was a very active uh, research partner in this. And this is Bill flaming one of his buckthorns. Um, it, I found it to be effective with autumn olive and honeysuckle. Jeff Ward found it effective with barberry. Multiflora rose It's going to be effective with relatively small clumps that are in the shade. And um, Bill and I are going back and forth on uh, whether it's effective on buckthorn, I monitored it just for two years. Bill's been subsequently monitoring it and found that that um, that the flamed trees that re-sprouted um, have uh, many of them have died. Okay, so winding this down, um, determining your management priorities. Um, look at the and consider whether or not you should take any action at all. Um, there are some situations you look at it and, and, and you know it's non-native, uh, but don't let the fact that it's non-native drive you into some kind of a management action. Uh, learn enough about the species and understand how it's working within your system and what's happening to decide whether or not you need to do anything. And you know, my particular case, I have this several, I mean, it's not carpeted with seedlings of Asiatic bittersweet, but you can go almost anywhere on my, on my uh, woodlot and look around in a 20-foot radius circle and find a few sprouts of this. When I find them, I pull them up, but I don't lose sleep over because they're not going to, um, I'm able to put enough time into this particular property that I'm assured that they're not going to become reproductively active. Now, if I was going to go into an area on my property and do some harvesting and, and create some sunlight, I'd be much more diligent about how much was there ahead of time, and I'd be very closely monitoring it after, afterwards. So the consequences of taking action um, depend a little bit on what other activities are happening on your property. And maybe you need to allocate your resources to higher priority sites or higher priority species. Uh, think about, as you're looking at the tools, the relative abundance of invasive or undesirable versus desirable species. If you have 10% um, interfering and 90% uh, desirable, that tells you you're not, that's a pretty easy one, you're not going to want to use a broadcast treatment. Uh, it's hard to imagine that you'd want to use a broadcast treatment. Uh, similarly, if you have 99% interfering and 1% desirable, there may be a stronger, there is a stronger argument, not absolute, but a stronger argument for using a broadcast treatment, whether it's mechanical or chemical. Uh, also recognize that there are other limiting factors such as deer, and even though you might control the interfering plant, deer may still continue to exclude uh, the desirable plants. So have some good venison recipes or be willing to invest in fencing. Uh, and then I've already I've spent a lot of time talking about costs, so I won't go into those anymore. Okay, so what are your next steps? First and foremost, always with anything you do on a property, you have to know what the ownership objectives are. So it's it's you and your spouse, you and your brother, you and your parents, you and your cousin, you and your hunting club, whatever it is, the owners have a set of objectives. They need to communicate about that, and everybody needs to be on board with uh, the, the decisions about managing vegetation in general, but particularly undesirable plants. Identify those areas that are top priorities for treatment. And what we've seen, most of these invasive plants um, respond well to increases in sunlight. Some of them respond very well to disturbances, such as the Japanese stilt grass. So if you have areas where you're going to do harvesting or clearing or building new roads or trails, whether it's a hiking trail or a skid trail, uh, you're going to be adding sunlight, opening up, uh, disturbing the leaf litter, 
Uh, those are areas you want to be sensitive to, looking for the presence, the existing presence of, of plants, and then monitoring them after the fact. A lot of these plants, if you get them when they're in small populations, um, you can much more easily manage them. Consider the options that you have available, and be sure to have a revegetation strategy before you begin treatment of these plants. Okay, so this is the this is the end. Let me click us into a different layout mode. Here we go. So we have the same basic information. Um, I'll call your attention. Some of you maybe came in late. There is a Ning site that I've set up, which is cornellforestconnect.ning.com, um, and there's some information on there. If you look in the blog. On November 14th, I have a blog entry talking about invasive plants. This presentation is already there as a handout. Many of the web links that I put up are there. If you all have some good uh, web links on invasive plants, I'd, I would very much welcome and encourage you, you going there and adding those as a comment into that blog site. Uh, at the top of the page is the uh, survey. Please uh, exit survey. Please take a minute to fill that out. Um, and then let me, I'm going to scroll back through this and see what other questions we have. I know I know, I missed a lot. Some of you were doing um, a lot of sharing, so that's, I, I appreciate that. Okay. So Betsy's seen hot, very, it must be very high deer pressure um, controlling multifloros. Multifloros has a, um, and I don't remember the nutrients per se, but it has pretty good nutritional quality as, as forage. Some of you may know um, more about the, the specifics of that. Sheep eat it uh, quite well. Goats eat it quite well. Um, in my mind, those are just domestic versions of deer. Um, so if, if they will eat it, the uh, deer will also probably eat it. Um, so that's uh, I, I'll, I'll say that that's good, but if your deer are abundant enough that they're keeping your multiflora rows in check, um, they're probably having some other uh, uh, pretty profound impacts as well. So Bill's gone back and, and kept track of the of the European buckthorn that we flamed. We had very high um, resprouting on that. We went back 12 months after the original flame, and that was three years ago maybe, um, and Bill said that many of these have now, some of the, the sprouted ones have continued to die off, and so he's um, recycling them through his wood stove. Okay, Carol has an abundance of growth, uh, which is the first time, I'm not sure what we were, what species we were talking about at the time, I'm sorry I missed that. Um, and right, the uh, the um, microstegium um, has some unique vegetar uh, reproductive um, characteristics, as Betsy mentioned. Uh, uh, Carl has problems with the spreading of wisteria on his property. He can control on the mold edge mode edges except in the edges of the wooded areas. He has difficulty controlling any suggestions. I'm not at all familiar with wisteria, so I will, um, hopefully some other people have experience with that and they can, they can chime in. And on English ivy. Boy, Carl, you're lucky. You have, you have all the good ones. Okay. Uh, and Betsy's, um, sharing experiences where there's been disturbances in terms of, of water scarification of the soil or after burns, um, openings in the understory, the, the Japanese stilt, gra ga stilt grass responds very favorably. And that was, that was consistent with the reading that I've done. I've only seen a little bit of this. I've never tried to manage it, um, but my sense is that it very aggressively um, comes in following disturbance. Okay, Fred. Strong correlation of stilt grass, roadside mowing with the flail mowers. Um, interesting. That was, um, you know, it starts along the road edge and then moves into the forest. And Betsy looks like she's seen the same thing. And that's what was reported in the literature, that it becomes established on these roadside edges and then moves in. 
Um, so if you can control it in those roadside edges, um, that would be a, a good starting point because it apparently doesn't spread very fast. The research that I found, the fastest rate of spread was um, 10 meters a year, which is pretty fast. Um, others said one meter, one to two meters every three years. So the, the, my sense is that it's not an overly fast spreading plant unless you have some disturbances. Okay. Okay, so so Fred points out that some of the New York towns are requiring pulling of bittersweet from trees after cutting because of concern for forest fires and fuel ladders. Um, I've and as he points out, this is likely a, a, a dramatization response to watching crown fires in the West. It's um, well, I'm sorry, Fred. <laughs> I don't know what else to, what else to say. That's a um, um, I, it, it seems to me I've done not much of this. Occasionally I've tried to pull grapevines out of trees and it seems to me that I, I usually have a great length of vine that comes cascading down from the crown and tries to whack me on the head or you end up you know, with dead branches that you're shaking loose. So I hope that, and I'm sure you are, um, you know, conscientious of, of personal safety hazards. So Betsy saw a couple of bittersweets at a location, uh, came back later, and all the plants on the edge of the road had been treated as all the rest were invasive. It isn't easy to pick up the American um, from the oriental intel if you don't pay close attention. That's, I haven't seen American bittersweet in 20 years. I haven't been looking for it. Um, but it, it, it's it's uh, it's vitally important, particularly with some of these like American bittersweet that are that are uncommon and becoming less common, to make sure that you know what you're dealing with. Uh, Steve talks about swallowwort. It's been put at the top of his priority list. Hopefully, it's not on your property yet. But if it is, then then you need to take action to start managing it. Japanese knotweed is a tough one. I put that in kind of the same category as Alanthus that. Um, it has such an incredible root system and an amazing ability to, of, to respond to disturbance. Some of these plants just are, are engineered so that they are, are disturbance responders. Japanese knotweed is, I think, one of those. I've heard reports where you can cover it with a geotextile fabric, put you know several inches of dirt and mulch on there, and then you'll kill it. I've also heard stories, though, that's from one person. I've heard other stories where, uh, for example, somebody mowed it, uh, put down gravel, and put an asphalt parking area over the top of a Japanese knotweed patch. And the Japanese knotweed came up through the gravel base and through the, through the asphalt. Um, a colleague of mine deliberately planted some in, in his front yard um, just so he could um, abuse it and see just how much physical abuse Japanese knot we could take. And you know, he goes out once a week and whacks on it with a shovel, shovel, and he runs over it with his lawnmower. And he's been doing this for a couple of years, and it's still alive. So I don't have any confidence in mechanical treatments for Japanese knotweed. A couple of chemical treatments, and, and the chemistry chemical treatments are also um, a challenge. The one that, that I've read is that's labeled in New York, well, that's a lot of work is you cut the stems, the stems are hollow, and then you inject glyphosate into the hollow stem. Um, you know, that's, I don't know how big of a patch you'd want to try to treat doing that. And if you have, you know, a couple hundred stems per square meter or square yard, um, that's, a, that's more than an afternoon job. Um, foliar treatments uh, might work. I'd have to, I haven't, because it doesn't really get into the forest too much that I've seen, uh, I haven't. I haven't looked into the management of Japanese knotweed, but it's one of the most common problems that people have. Um, so uh, uh, Jeff wants to know my email. My email is on the screen. You can see it there, PJS23. Any of you are welcome to contact me at any time uh, with any questions. Email is the best way for me to respond because 
Um, I usually, you know, I'm not in a situation when I can answer my phone, and I do a lot of email late at night or early in the morning. So if you can send me an email, um, that's preferred. But feel free to call me. I, I try to return all the phone calls, although I'm not always successful. Okay, thanks for the kind words. Betsy is talking about ivy and wisteria and knotweed. Um, so do it, do an, do an uh, online search. Thank you, Betsy. There's there's a lot of um, really good online information about these uh, uh, management managing these species and uh, fact sheets. I like the National Park Service has good ones. Uh, Nature Conservancy has good ones. Some of the invasive plant management councils have very good ones. So look them up. Talk to your extension educators. Uh, whoever's in your state, or they have a maybe a weed specialist, um, and find out some different options that you have available. And then what it may amount to is doing a little bit of experimentation and seeing what works. So, okay. So Carl wants the. Continuing Ed site. Let's see if I can find that. You remember which note that was? That note four? Nope. Oh, that was a chat pod. Just a second, Carl. Here it is. Oh, don't type in that one. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Don't type in that one. Oh, I did that too low, didn't I? Okay. Um, Betsy points out I got stuff moved around here. So Steve found that mowing it made it spread. That's not surprising. Many of these root suckering plants um, are stimulated by the disturbance. So he's been cutting in glyphosate, which helped a bit. Um, now he's mowing the perimeter and uh, working his way towards the center. That's a, uh, a labor of love, it sounds like. Barth wants to know if American bittersweet is a desirable neighbor, na native plant. My sense is that it is. It doesn't have any of the, I'm not, I've never heard of it having any of the negative characteristics that Japanese bittersweet has. It has the same kind of fruit. It is a twining vine, so it has, uh, if you like the look of the vine, um, aesthetically, it's, it's nice. Um, and I don't, I'm not aware that it has any negative characteristics. Um, Betsy's uh, talking more about knotweed, where they've cut it back in June, waited five weeks, uh, so it comes up, um, and, and then spraying it. And, and the logic there is that you need to let, you need to have enough surface area of leaf so that you have uh, an adequate wicking surface to move the chemical into the plant. Um, and she's found good luck with that um, in New York. And I don't know if. Betsy and Steve are in New York. Make sure in New York there are some species, uh, some species, some uh, herbicides that are labeled for use on knotweed and some that are not. If you go back to that um, PIMS site, you can find the link. And I'll, I'll try to remember to put that on that blog entry. There's a, a site where you can find the emergence called the 2EE, the emergency exemptions that uh, allow for um, particular uses of pesticides for problem plants that are not otherwise specifically labeled for that. So Dave has, looks like, um, has all the undesirables on Cape Cod. Jeff has uh, backfilled and paved and the knotweed came up through the blacktop. So, okay, well, we've uh, we've lost about half of you. Um, we're at 8:40. Wow, we, this is great 
great questions, great conversations. You all had uh, you know, a lot of good questions and interactions. I appreciate that very much. Um, and uh, I'll uh, look to see you all in December. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And um, uh, be deliberate in your management of invasive plants. And be safe. Above all, be safe. So thank you all, and have a great evening.